Well, Dr. Milioni, I don't know that you would have any reason to know this at all, but uh, Psalm 115 verse 1 is the theme verse for our church at Quail Springs Baptist Church. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to be here with you today at uh, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. I praise the Lord for this school. I'm thankful to God for what this school was in my life when I was a student here. And then I'm thankful to God for what this school was when I was a professor here and had the opportunity to serve here for seven years on the faculty. But can I tell you something? I am thankful to God beyond measure for what this school is right now and for what it will be and for what I know God is going to do through Southeastern Seminary and through you in the days to come. So it's been a great joy to be on the campus uh, this week. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to be in classrooms and to talk about preaching and to, to meet with students and uh, pastors and just all kinds of things that God has given us the opportunity to do this week. I praise the Lord for that. Now I want you to take your Bible if you have a copy of God's Word and I want you to turn with me please to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and this morning I want to talk to you about the priority of the gospel. The priority of the gospel. Over 130 years ago a guy named John Pemberton, who worked in Atlanta, Georgia, had invented a new soft drink. And he had a partner, a business partner, a bookkeeper, Frank Robinson, and they began to work together to think about how to market and sell that soft drink. And Frank Robinson was really instrumental in sort of thinking about the best way to bring this new drink to the public. He wanted to give it a name that people would remember, and so he gave it a name with two C's. You already know what the name is, Coca-Cola. But he also wanted Coca-Cola to have a label, a look that people would recognize and remember. And so he went home, and in his own handwriting... He wrote a very ornate version of the words Coca-Cola. He came back in and brought it to everyone who was working there at that brand new company. And everybody agreed that something about the way he had written it in fancy script just sort of caught your eye and captured your attention. And that became the Coca-Cola label. They put it on every bottle. I don't have to put the Coca-Cola label up on the screen for you to see it. As soon as I say it, you know what it looks like. In fact, I can't even say Coca-Cola without you seeing it in that script that that man used all those years ago. And for over 130 years, two things have never changed about Coca-Cola, really. The label on the bottle and the formula inside the bottle. Now, they've marketed Coca-Cola in different ways over the years. In the 1930s, they marketed Coca-Cola as a reminder of happy times. In the 1940s, it was marketed and advertised as a reminder of the American way of life and what it means to come back home. In the turbulent 1960s and 70s, it was marketed as a beloved American soft drink that taught the world to sing in perfect harmony. In the 1980s and even into the 90s, the slogan was, have a Coke and a smile. But two things never changed. What was on the bottle and what was in the bottle. Hold on. There was a time they changed what was in the bottle. Same label, but something different in the bottle. And when they did that, there was an uproar. People said, we don't like this. Change it back. And since then... Two things that never changed. What was on the bottle and what's in the bottle. I want to talk to you about the priority of the gospel. Gospel, that's the label. That's the word. The English word comes from the old Anglo-Saxon that means good news, good spiel, good story. The Greek word is euangelion. It again means good message, good news, good story. That's the label 
on the bottle. And man, I like that label. I love to talk about the gospel. I love to talk about evangelism. I love to share the good news of Jesus with others and just talk about what it means to be a gospel-centered church and a gospel-centered person and a gospel-centered family and a gospel-centered message. I love that. But there are times that we take that label and we change the formula of what's in the bottle. We start to to change the the, the message of the gospel into something that it was never intended to be. The Word of God tells us there are two things we need to guard over. We need to guard over that word gospel. (laughs) And we need to guard over what's in the bottle. What do we mean when we say gospel? That's what I want to talk to you about today in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to stand with me as we read God's Word together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want us to look at verses 1 through 11 of this text. And and, and as I preach today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to focus on verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to fold back all the other verses upon what we see in verses 1 and 2. But we'll read verses 1 1 through 11 as we begin. The Apostle Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. This is the word of God. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your word. I ask you, God, that you would move me out of the way. And Lord, speak a word to your people in this place today to transform us and to remind us of the priority of your gospel. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And brothers and sisters, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look at this passage of Scripture, and as we do, I want you to notice three priorities that God has established for the gospel. Three priorities that God has established for the gospel. And the first one is this. God has established the priority of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's established the priority of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So look in verse 1 of the text, and Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers... Of the gospel I preach to you. Stop right there. Two times, even in those words that I've just read, Paul uses the word gospel. You can't see it as clearly in the English, but in the Greek, he uses both the noun form and the verb form of the word euangelion. And so he says, I would remind you of the gospel that I gospeled to you. Or I would remind you of the evangel that I evangelized. To you, he says, I want you to remember this message of the gospel. Now, now I would submit to you that if somebody needs to be reminded of something, that means they've probably forgotten something. You don't need to be reminded of something unless you've forgotten it. And so, there were people in the church in Corinth who had begun to forget the priority of the gospel and maybe even forget some things about the content. Of the gospel. And as a result, there were all kinds of problems and difficulties in that church. They were split up in all kinds of different ways, and they were pursuing all kinds of different missions, and there were all kinds of factions and fightings going on in that church. They needed to be reminded of the gospel. That was the church in Corinth. 
When I was a beginning pastor, I, I, I would drive on Mondays from the little church I pastored out in Franklin County across to Goldsboro, and I, I would meet with a pastor there who just took, took some time out to mentor me. And basically what he did was this. He'd bring me into, into his office, and I would sit down, and whatever he had preached to his congregation on Sunday, he just preached to me, just he and I. He just preached his whole sermon to me. And he always called me the same thing. He always called me, young brother Stephen. And he, he, and he, he spoke with sort of a Scottish accent, which was interesting because he was from Gastonia. But anyway, he, he spoke like that. And, and he would just tell me things. I remember one day, I, as I was driving, I passed by a church, and I had seen it before, but I, it just got my attention that day. And, and the sign on the church said, Corinth Baptist Church. And I got there, and I asked him, Dr. Wright, why would any church who has read the New Testament name their church Corinth Baptist Church? There's so much sin there, so much problem. Why would they name their church Corinth Baptist Church? I'll never forget what he said. He said, young brother Stephen, I don't know why they named that church Corinth Baptist Church. And he said, but if the Lord Jesus got to name all of his churches, there'd be a whole lot more Corinth Baptist Churches. So many churches get away from the gospel. So many preachers need to be reminded of the gospel so many christians need someone to stir up our memory about the gospel so paul says i remind you brothers of the gospel that i gospel to you now look in verse 3 of the text paul says for i delivered to you as of first importance what i also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's the gospel. He said, I came in, and I proclaimed the gospel. And he said, I proclaimed it and delivered it to you as of first importance. It was his priority. It was the first thing that he talked about He also recognized it was the most important thing, the essential thing for him to talk about. I think about Paul coming into that city of Corinth, in all likelihood the first Christian ever to come into that city. Port cities are always sinful. Corinth had two ports. They were doubly sinful. And he came into that place that was pagan and where there was so much idolatry and all kinds of sin. And he came into that place with this message, the message of the gospel. I delivered it, I delivered it to you as of first importance. Here's what that means. That means the first time Paul talked to you, he talked to you about the gospel. If he came to your house and sat down and you began to have a conversation with him and the conversation began to wander away to other things, he'd always take it back to the gospel. As he was leaving your house and saying goodbye, he'd say, hey, listen, I, I got to go. But before I go, one more thing. And he'd remind you of the gospel. It permeated everything he had to say. Notice what he delivered to them. I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures the gospel says that christ died and that he died for our sins may i remind you that when jesus died he was not a martyr dying for a cause he was a savior dying for your sin your sin put him on that cross your sin held him there he died for our sins and he did so the bible says in accordance with the scriptures over 700 years before jesus christ was born the prophet isaiah looked through space and time and saw the suffering servant of the lord and said he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities surely he has borne all of our sorrows and by his stripes we are healed christ died for your sins according to the scriptures that's the gospel but the gospel doesn't end there the bible says and he was buried And he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The one who died for you did not stay in that grave. On the third day, he came out of that grave victorious over sin and death forever. And the Bible says he did that according to the scriptures. 
David looked through space and time and saw the Messiah there in that grave and realized the Messiah would not stay there. In Psalm 16, verse 10, he said, For you will not abandon my soul to the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. He died for your sins according to the Scriptures. He rose on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Add to it, it's not the gospel. Take from it, not the gospel, but proclaim it, and it's the gospel. It's the power to save everyone who believes. I'm talking about the priority of proclaiming the gospel. And may I remind you before I move to my next point, the gospel is made primarily to be proclaimed. Not too long ago, Michelle and I noticed some bear patches in our backyard and so we went to I don't know Home Depot or Lowe's wherever and we bought some grass seed and and we came home and, and I opened up the seed and went to the backyard and I, I scattered the seed and and then in just a few days little sp- sprouts of grass began to come up in those bear patches I don't know all the things about how seed works I don't know how it germinates. I don't know how it it, grows. I don't know all those things. A botanist would know. A horticulturist would know. A gardener would would probably know a lot more than I would ever know. But I know this. If I sow the seed, the grass grows. I want you to imagine something. Imagine that we bought that seed, and I took the seed, and I put it in the garage. And uh, a couple of days go by, maybe a week or two goes by, and those bear patches are still there. And Michelle says, Stephen, uh, have you sown that seed? And I said, no, I haven't sown it yet. I'm studying it. And she says, what do you mean? Well, I'm studying it. She said, well, how are you studying it? And I said, well, I've, I've opened up the bag. And every now and then I go into the garage. And I just get a handful of that seed. And I look at it. And I just contemplate the beauty of the seed. I think about how powerful the seed is. In fact, I've gotten so excited about meditating on this seed and contemplating the seed. I, I've gotten involved in a, in a text group with some other guys. And we just we talk to one another about how powerful the seed is. We're just talking about it all the time. This seed is so powerful. I'm just studying and meditating over The seed, is there anybody in this room who would think I could get away with doing that? No. Because the seed is not meant primarily to be studied. The seed is meant to be sown. I don't want to take one ounce away from the importance of studying the gospel and contemplating the gospel And giving God glory for the gospel. And talking to other believers about the gospel. And meditating over the power of the gospel in our own lives. I wouldn't take one drop of significance away from that. But may I remind you, the gospel is like seed. And seed is meant to be sown. God calls you where you are to proclaim the gospel. Pastor, God calls you to stand in your pulpit and proclaim the gospel. He calls you to go to your community and talk to people and share the gospel to make it the first priority. Christian, God calls you to proclaim the gospel. We see the priority of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then secondly in this text, God has established the priority of receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. The priority of receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look back in verse 1 of the text. Paul says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand. He said, I proclaimed it. I I gospeled the gospel to you. And then you received it. The word received there means to welcome something. He said, "You, you heard the gospel and you didn't stiff arm it. You heard the gospel and you didn't shut your door to it. You heard the gospel even though it confronted you in your sin and even though it presented something that you and your paganism never even understood. You heard the gospel and you rolled out the red carpet for it. 
You put out the welcome mat for it. You received the gospel. And then not only that, he says, you took your stand. You stand in the gospel. The gospel which you received in which you stand. That word stand in the original language is in the perfect tense. It, it means you stood on the gospel and you continued standing on the gospel. You took your stand on the gospel. And then beginning in verse 5 of this chapter, Paul begins to describe people who were transformed by the gospel, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They took their stand on it. They received it and it transformed their lives. One of the people he talks about is Peter. Look in verse 5. The Bible says Jesus appeared to Cephas, Peter. Peter had denied Jesus Christ three times and wept bitterly. But then he saw the risen Lord Jesus Christ and he was confronted by the glory of the gospel of the resurrection and it changed him into a bold preacher who lived the rest of his life proclaiming the gospel. Why? He took his stand on it. He received it. And then it continues on. He, you, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. The, the phrase the twelve is a technical name for the first disciples. Those men had been frightened and weak and fighting among themselves. There were all kinds of problems that the twelve had. But they were transformed by the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And history tells us that all but one of them laid down their lives as martyrs for the sake of insisting that Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross and rose again and that they had seen him. They received the gospel of Jesus Christ. He continues on. He was seen by 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This just reminds us that the good news of the resurrection wasn't something that just happened in a corner somewhere 500 people saw the risen Lord at once they were transformed as they received the gospel and then the Bible says that he appeared to James that that's the half brother of the Lord Jesus Christ and then to all the apostles James was a man who rejected Jesus during Jesus earthly life he disbelieved he thought his half brother Jesus was crazy but when Jesus Christ rose from the grave, James saw him and received the good news of the resurrection. He became a great and powerful leader in the church proclaiming the gospel. Why? He had received the gospel. And then Paul points to himself. He says, then he appeared to me. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul was... On the road to Damascus, the Bible says in the book of Acts that he was breathing threats and murder against the followers of Jesus. He wasn't looking for the gospel. He wasn't searching for Jesus. He was searching for Christians to persecute. And Jesus found him and spoke to him and transformed him because he received the gospel. When we receive the gospel, it transforms us. And it's amazing what God can do in our lives when we proclaim the gospel and when people hear and receive the gospel. There was a, a boyfriend and girlfriend from China who came to Oklahoma as uh, exchange students. They came and began to study at Oklahoma University. And uh, when they got there, neither of them were believers in Jesus Christ. But somewhere along the way, the young lady heard the gospel, and she trusted Jesus as her Savior, and she was saved, and, and God just changed her life. Her boyfriend had moved over from China to America with her. He did not receive Christ as his Savior. They wound up getting married. Not too long after that, they had a little girl. And as the little girl was growing, maybe she was two or three years old, the mother really wanted to make sure their daughter was in church but the father still not a Christian said I, I don't want her to go to church he had grown up in communist China and he knew how in Chinese preschools from the very beginning children were sort of brainwashed to accept communism and he didn't want his little girl to be brainwashed into Christianity and he said I don't want her to go to church with you and, and the mother said well I really it means so much to me if you if you just let her go and he said I tell you what he said, she can go, but I'll go with her, 
and I'll sit in the back of her preschool class to make sure she doesn't get brainwashed into Christianity. Try not to get ahead of me on this story. He began to come every week, and he heard the stories of Jesus that the teacher was sharing with those preschoolers. He heard who Jesus was and how Jesus lived and what Jesus said and what Jesus did and how Jesus died on the cross and how he rose from the grave. He didn't get brainwashed. He got saved. He trusted Jesus Christ as his Savior. Their daughter later trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And God began a heritage of godliness in that family that had been so far from God. Why? Because someone proclaimed the gospel and they received the gospel. The Bible talks about the priority of receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. May, may I remind you that the gospel is for every kind of person in every kind of place with every kind of problem. And if we are faithful in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with others, God will use that to transform lives. The priority of receiving the gospel. There's a third thing I want you to see in this text as I continue. Number three, the Bible talks about the priority of embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ. The priority of embracing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now look back in verse 2 of the text. Paul, speaking of the gospel, says this, by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain. He said, I came and I preached this message. You received it. And as you received it, you took a stand on it. And he said, by this message, you are being saved. I love that because it's a reminder to me that salvation is both punctiliar and progressive. <laughs> there's, a, there's a punctiliar time when you have to pass from death into life, from sin into salvation, far from God and brought close to God. There has to be a time when you are saved. But praise God, it doesn't stop there. Salvation is also continuous so that even after you are saved, you continue to be saved. And that's what Paul talks about here, by which you are being saved. Man, when I was six years old, I trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I was saved. But can I tell you, I have been being saved ever since then. It's sort of like diving into a pool. As soon as you dive in, you're as wet as you can get, but you can still swim deeper. And salvation works the same way. You come to Jesus, and the moment you trust him, you're as saved as you can be, but you can still go deeper. And so he says, by which you are being saved. And then he says this, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you. How, how can you tell that someone has been saved by the gospel. You can tell by the way they embrace the gospel. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believed in vain. Can I just stop right here? I think sometimes we fool ourselves into thinking that if we'll just present the gospel in the most perfect way that everybody who hears and professes to be saved will continue and be saved but I would tell you there's not one person in here who could proclaim the gospel better than the apostle Paul not one of us you say well they need discipleship there's not one person in here who knows how to disciple somebody better than the apostle Paul did he had come and preached the gospel to them himself, and yet he held out the, the, the possibility that some of them may have believed in vain. The word in vain there means empty. They, they said they believed, but it was empty. You know, one of the things that, that we say in the Baptist church, and I, I'm a Baptist, I've always been a Baptist, but there's something we say in the Baptist church. I'll say the beginning part of it. You'll say the second part of it. We say once saved what? always saved and I believe that I hope you believe that but we got a lot of people in our churches who are saying always saved who have never been once saved 
How do you show that you've been once saved? You show that by embracing the gospel, by holding fast to the word. Paul even talks about what God had done in his own life. Look in verse 10. He says, I, I'm, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. But Jesus Christ appeared to me. And he says, by the grace of God, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not, here's the same phrase, not in vain. He said, some of you may have believed in vain. His grace toward me was not in vain. And how did he show that? On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. He showed that he had trusted in Jesus. He showed that he had believed the gospel by the way he embraced the gospel and held fast and saw the grace of God hold fast in his life. When, when Michelle and I were 21 and 22 years old, we did something. Uh, we, we stood at the front of a church, and she was on one side, and I was on the other side, and there was a, a pastor in between us. And the goal of the ceremony was to move that guy out of the way. That was the goal of the ceremony. <laughs> she had on a beautiful white lace bridal gown that had been custom fitted to her and that she wore on that day and has never worn again. I had on a rental suit that another guy had worn seven days before and another guy would wear seven days after. And, and there were five other guys lined up who looked just like me. They were all wearing the same thing. Somebody said it just shows all men are alike. We might as well just dress them like they're all alike. But we stood there, and we said things to each other. We made promises to one another. And, and we said something like this. I take you to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Now, I was 22 years old when I said those things, and I meant everything I said. But can I tell you, I didn't understand what most of those things meant. I understood to have and to hold. I was all into that. I mean, I was really excited about to have and to hold. <laughs> but then there's some things I said, and I meant them. I didn't fully understand what I was committing to. From this day forward, for better, for worse. We didn't know anything about for better, for worse. We just knew about for better. In sickness and in health, we didn't know anything about in sickness and in health. We knew in health. We've learned some of those things over the years. We still don't fully know till death do us part. But here's what I want you to hear me say. I said those things then. And she said those things then. And we have shown that we meant those things then by what we have done since then. Is everybody with me? Say amen. You show that you meant it then. You show that it was real then by what happens after then. I think that's what Paul is talking about here. You heard this message in which you stand, by which you are being saved. This gospel message, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. How do you show that Jesus Christ has really changed your life? You show that you've been truly saved by your continuing, persevering attachment to Jesus Christ throughout your life. That's embracing the gospel. Say, Jesus, I've given my heart and my life to you. I've surrendered to you. You've changed my life, and he continues to change. Does that mean that, that things don't happen? Does that mean that there aren't crises that come along? Absolutely not. Those things happen. But someone who has truly been saved will hold fast to the word preached to them. And they'll continue on in that message. How about you?
How about you? Are you showing that you've been saved by the way you are serving and following Jesus Christ today? Sometimes we only talk about our salvation in the past tense. Like it was something that we checked off. Listen, being saved is more than just saying, "Uh uh-huh, to a series of statements about Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-huh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Uh Uh-huh, I believe he died on the cross. Uh Uh-huh, I trust him as my Savior. Uh Uh-huh, I'll follow him and and serve him and and preach his word or minister to his church. uh Uh-huh, I'll do it. It's more than just saying "Uh uh-huh to those things. It's daily surrender to him because of the priority of the gospel that has gripped your life. And so Paul says at the end of our text, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. His heart was gripped by the priority of the gospel. I want you to imagine that you wake up maybe at an early morning hour The sun is just coming up, but that's not what wakes you up. You you wake up because you smell smoke in your house. And you can tell that the smoke is getting thicker, and and so you wake up everybody in the house, and and you begin to make your way out. And I I don't know where the the fire is. Maybe it's in the kitchen, or maybe it's in the living room, or or maybe it's in one of the kids' bedrooms. But you get everybody safely, and you, you begin to take them out of the house, and you get out on the sidewalk. And when you get there, you call 911, and you're waiting for the fire trucks to come, and they come. They're come come just roaring up there. The sirens are blazing. Everything's going on. They're coming up, and as the firefighters get out of the truck, They run up to your house, and you see there's about three firefighters, and they've got gardening shears. And they step up there, and they start to prune the bushes in front of your house. And you run up to them, and you say, what are you doing? And they say, well, we're we're, we're, we're trimming these hedges. And and you say, why are you doing that? Because the, the hedges need trimming. You say, the house is on fire. And they say, yeah, but, but these, these hedges are a house issue too. And they need to be taken care of. And, and, and we'll take care of this, and then we'll take care of the house. And, and, and then you run away from them, and you see another group of guys, firefighters, and they're mixing up something. They've got trowels, and they've got bags, and they got, they've got gravel, and they're, they're mixing it all together. You say, what are you doing? They say, well, we're, we're mixing up some concrete because you've got some cracks in your sidewalk here, and we want to mend those cracks. And you say, the house is on fire. And they say, yeah, but these, the sidewalk and these cracks, that's a house issue too. We need to take care of that first. No firefighter would do that. But churches do it. Christians do it. Pastors do it. Sometimes denominations do it. We start trying to fix every other problem. I'm not saying they aren't real problems. They are real problems. But when the house is on fire, that's not the priority. The priority is get that house taken care of. Get that fire Put out. That's the urgency of the gospel. The house is on fire. People are dying and going to hell. And God has not called us primarily to make planet earth the best of all possible places from which to die and go to hell. God has called us to transform people's lives by the power of of the gospel that's why it's such a high priority I'm not saying other things aren't important they are I'm not saying that there aren't other things that we need to do we do but I'm saying we must make the gospel our priority and you may say brother Stephen who, who are you targeting with saying this who are you who are you who are you talking to who are you getting at? I'm talking to me I'm probably talking to you and just saying to you, brothers and sisters, let's make it our mission. We've been called by God and we've been given the treasure of the gospel. Let's make sure that the same thing on the label is the same thing 
in the bottle and share the good news of Jesus Christ who died for our sins according to Scripture. Jesus Christ who rose from the grave according to the Scripture. Jesus Christ who transforms the lives of those who receive him and embrace him. Let's make the gospel our priority as we serve the Lord Jesus. Will you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, we love you, we praise you. I thank you for every person here. And God, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that it transforms the life of everyone who believes. Thank you, Lord, that you would look to us. Lord, we, we would, even as Paul said what he said, I'm not worthy to be an apostle. Lord, we're not worthy to preach the gospel. We're not worthy to share the gospel one-on-one -on -one with someone else. But, Lord, you have not entrusted the message of the gospel to a mighty angel from heaven. You've entrusted it to people like us who have been saved. And so, Lord, we pray that we would hold fast to the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would continue in it and continue to be transformed by it. And, Lord, we pray, whether we're standing on a platform or whether we're sitting in a restaurant or whether we're standing on a doorstep, or wherever we are, Lord, use us to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others that we might reach people with your gospel. For we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you, and thank you for letting me speak to you today.